some space in the audience. Philip Hose is here for some storytelling about Pete Seeger and some songs. So this is the start of the Pete Seeger tribute. Come on over, find a chair. <laughs> okay, come on over to the performance tent to begin the Pete Seeger tribute with Philip Hose and some storytelling and songs. He's a peace-loving man. And you know, I when I read the book called It's Our World Too, there was, which he wrote, um, I was struck by the fact that the dolphins say tuna that's on all the cans, you know? That was a high school kid in Maine that started that. And I learned that by reading Phil's book. Anyway, some of his books will be here shortly, and Phil is ready to tell stories and sing songs. Thank you, Phil. Uh, Pete Seeger, I first met Pete Seeger when I was three years old, but I didn't know it. <laughs> there was this song and it was all over the place. And I remember begging my father to put a nickel in the jukebox and play it again and again and again. This was 1950. And this will probably be the first time that a, a presentation has ever begun with this song. <laughs> and we need you. <clears throat> last Saturday, last Saturday night, I got married. Me and my wife. Pete Seeger, I was in college, and again, I didn't know it. <laughs> there are all these great songs that he had written, Turn, 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 Where Have All the Flowers Gone, Whim Away, and, and, or that he had adapted, and uh, I just thought they were great songs, but I had no idea where they came from. Other people did them, and so Pete Seeger was not getting famous, but the songs were, were getting famous, and... Uh, and it was quite wonderful. And then the third time I met Pete Seeger was in, I think, 1986. The People's Music Network, which is a collection of uh, topical songwriters, I guess, had uh, staged an event, said they had announced an event in Philadelphia in a big church hall, saying that the, the purpose of it was to show that topical songwriting was not dead. It hadn't died in the 60s. So 33 songwriters would be chosen to sing one song each. And somehow I got chosen to be one of those 33. I, I'd only written like two or three songs in my life, but this song kind of got around. And I went to Philadelphia. And the name of my song was... Uh, and, and Pete Seeger was going to be the MC. That was it. And... Uh, I was really shy, you know, I wasn't well established or anything like that, and I remember walking around uh, with people, trying to meet people, and there was this woman named Marcy Boyd, who was a, a songwriter, 
And I said, uh, you know, we, got, we fell into talk. I said, Marcy, what song are you going to do tonight? She said, I just heard this great new song I like called What If The Russians Don't Come? You know, that was the only song I knew. It was the only song I had ever written. I begged her. And she was on like number 16 out of the 33 in the, in the big hall. And she'd say things like, I, I have to think about it. I have to think about it. I, I, it man, it was killing me. And the other big question that was going on, will Pete Seeger actually stay up for all 33 songs to be the MC to introduce the song? I knew I was number 30, so I went to dinner that night fraught with tension. And uh, knowing no one, sitting alone, and Pete Seeger sat down next to me and said, would you like some coffee? Would you like some coffee? I can't imitate it very well. What a sweetheart. So he, he gets me some coffee. We start talking. He stays around for, uh, for my chance. And he loved the song. And told me, here's, here's the song, or at least a scrap of it. That, uh, what, if the Russians... what if the Russians don't come? So I grew up, like lots of you guys, just fear, fearsome, under tables, you know, knowing that you know, our chances were, were not very good. And it just seemed to me that we stiffened because of that. You know, we were just so, you know, for instance, I wrote this uh, song. My town made a plan for its civil defense. We'll all take Route 70 when it gets tense. My wife sewed a map into my underclothes so that I'll know where to run when the big whistle blows. We had a rehearsal last Saturday night and all things considered the town did all right except on the ramp when that bus tried to pass and it took us three hours to clean up the glass. What if the Russians don't come? What if they like where they're from? What if they're not in the mood to invade? What if they're tired or drunk or afraid? What would we do if their generals just said this is dumb? Russian since I was a type, and here's what I know about what they are like. They don't believe in God, and they never have fun. They're brainwashed and dull, and they all weigh a ton. And in the Olympics, whenever we meet, their women are men, and their judges all cheap. But maybe you shouldn't rely just on me because I've not seen a Russian except on TV. What if the Russians have lives? What if they're husbands and wives? If they come home late from work on the bus and have to fix dinner for children that fuss? They might be too tired to come put us under their thumb. What if the Russians don't come? The president says we're behind in the race and we need his new missile just to keep pace. Cause if we don't stay up with them lap after lap, the Russians will come blow us right off the bat. May be slow, but there's times I forget what I got against all these folks I ain't met. I can't figure out why they want World War III. Could it be they're wondering the same about me? What if the Russians are scared? What if they're all unprepared? It may be that Ivan's as tired as I am, tired of worrying about Uncle Sam. Why don't we stop before one of us does something dumb? Why the Russians don't come?
So, uh, I stayed in, in touch with Pete through the People's Music Network, and we made a spin-off, the, the Children's Music Network. We were dead against garbage for children in, you know, music, and we wanted songs of, of the environment, of good climate, of, of peace, of nonviolence, and so a bunch of us launched, and Pete got right after it. He was right, he refused to be on the board, but he said that he would be our letters to the editor, editor, if we would ever get a magazine. So right away, of course, we ginned up a magazine and nobody wrote any letters to the editor. So Pete made them up. He wrote these angry, controversial letters that he would answer. You know? <laughs> uh, but, you know, he, he, was, he was just wonderful and he was the perfect person to be with us in children's music because he had, and people don't know this, he had this huge background in children's music. His stepmother, Ruth Crawford Seeger, wrote a book which was the classic book, uh, it was called Folk Songs for American Children. And it's, a, it's still, to this day, is a great collection. Um, it was uh, illustrated by Maine's Barbara Cooney, Miss Rumpheus. In fact, Pete, Pete had a grudge with her because he, he looked at the pages and there were all these children, drawings of children, but none of them were black. And half the songs were, you know, spirituals and so forth. So he, he wrote to her and said, you know, what's the deal? And she said, I don't know how to draw Negroes. That's what he said. So uh, they came out with a second edition with a few uh, black drawings in it. Anyway, Pete knew all these children's songs. He'd done all this research. Uh, and he helped us, the Children's Music Network, in our fledgling years immeasurably. There was nothing he wouldn't do. He did fundraisers for us. He showed up, did interviews for our magazine, which boost. In fact, I want you all to know about the Children's Music Network. You can Google it, or you can bring it up with uh, www.cmn, Children's Music, dot, Children's Music Network, cmnonline.org. And it's a wonderful organization. Anyway, uh, he didn't write very many songs for children. He wrote one about burping his child with the bubble going up. <laughs> and he wrote one called Sweepy, 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 about, about doing your chores. But he was a, a, a great popularizer in the same way as he popularized and spread and pollinated We Shall Overcome. He did the same thing with a bunch of children's music. And he called the ones that he loved the best his all-time world beaters. And his two all-time world beaters were She'll Be Coming Around the Mountain. Because he had all these, whoa, no, yum, yum. He had all these things. I couldn't begin to do it. I, I'd break in half if I, if I did that. But his second one... Uh, we're going to sing with you now. Sandra Lee St. George is going to join me. Sandy and I, uh, besides being married, are uh, we sing at the pediatric wing of the Children's Hospital in, uh, in Portland. And this was uh, the other children's song that Pete just loved the most. This is a group sing, especially in the chorus. The kids will know it. And if you want to. There was an old lady swallowed a fly. I don't know why she swallowed a fly. Perhaps she'll die. There was an old lady who swallowed a spider. It wiggled and jiggled and jiggled inside. She swallowed a spider to catch the fly. But I don't know why she swallowed a fly. Perhaps she'll die. There was no lady who swallowed a bird. Oh my word! She swallowed a bird. She swallowed a bird to catch the spider that wiggled and jiggled and tickled inside her. She swallowed the spider to catch the fly. But I don't know why she swallowed a fly. Perhaps she'll die. There was no lady who swallowed a cat. Oh, imagine that! She swallowed a cat. She swallowed a cat to catch the bird. She swallowed the bird to catch the spider that wiggled and jiggled and tickled inside her. 
while the spider didn't catch the fly. But I don't know why she swallowed the fly. Perhaps she'll die. There was an old lady who swallowed a dog. What a hog! She swallowed a dog. She swallowed the dog to catch the cat. She swallowed the cat. Wild the spider to catch the fly. I don't know why she swallowed the fly. Perhaps she'll die. There was no lady who swallowed a goat. She just opened her throat and swallowed a goat. She swallowed the goat to catch the dog. She swallowed the dog to catch the cat. Wild the spider to catch the fly, but I don't know why she swallowed up the fly. Perhaps she'll die. There was no lady to swallow a horse, but of course she swallowed a horse. She swallowed the horse to catch the goat. Swallowed the goat to catch the dog. Swallowed the dog to catch the cat. Swallowed the cat. Follow the bird to catch the spider that wiggled and jiggled and tickled the spider. She's wild the spider to catch the fly. But I don't know why she swallowed a fly. Perhaps she'll fly. There was no lady who swallowed a rhinoceros. <laughs> How preposterous to swallow a rhinoceros? She swallowed rhinoceros to catch the horse. She swallowed the horse to catch the goat. She swallowed the goat to catch the dog. She swallowed the dog to catch the cat. She swallowed the cat to catch the bird. She swallowed the bird to catch the spider. They wiggled and jiggled and jiggled inside her. She swallowed the spider to catch the fly. I don't know why she swallowed the fly. How sinister! Swallow a minister? And that finished her. Sandra Lee St. George! It was a good thing that Pete knew all those children's songs, too, because uh, in 1955 he was summoned by the House Un American oh. Affairs uh, Committee and uh, they had all sorts of questions that they wanted to ask him. Uh, they were invested in witch hunting communism. And Pete took a very brave stand. He, uh, instead of taking the, the Fifth Amendment, which would have been brave enough, which says, you don't have the right to ask me this question, he took the, the uh, First Amendment, which said, uh, you don't have the right uh, to ask anybody to answer these questions. He, he broadened it. He was uh, convicted and... and uh, he, he later uh, won on appeal, but uh, there for a while he was blacklisted. And all the fame that he had uh, made with the Weavers, who did Irene Goodnight and had a number one hit uh, off it, was really gone. And more important, so was the income. He couldn't play in clubs anymore and so forth. There was really nobody that would hire him. And really children's music kept Pete Seeger alive during that time. He sang for $25 a pop at uh, camps, you know, and schools. I have all sorts of friends who had him as their music teacher at the Little Red Schoolhouse in, uh, in Greenwich Village uh, until he could get himself back on, on his feet again. And uh, so by the time we got a hold of him in, in the 1980s with the Children's Music Network, he knew a million songs. And he was great with them. I mean, he had this one called I Know an Old Rooster, and he would draw. And he'd draw a, he'd sing a verse, and he'd draw a line, and he'd ask the kids, what am I drawing? And it took him a while, and then he'd say, a rooster, and then on the, he just loved singing to and with children. 
He said Woody Guthrie was very nervous around him. He only heard Woody sing once in Canada. And about, as Pete put it, it was an unruly mob of 200 kids. And he said, take over, would you, Pete? <laughs> and, uh, and Pete did it. Um, over the years, I, I got to work with him and, and uh, know him pretty well, uh, especially through the magazine and so forth. And he, I write books, as has been said, and uh, there were several titles that he really liked and really supported. The one that he seemed to like the best, actually there were two that he liked the best, but the first one was called We Were There Too, Young People in U.S. History. Thank you. And it's a, a compendium of 66 nonfiction stories, 33 boys, 33 girls, of kids from those who went on uh, the Nina and Pete and the Santa Maria with Columbus, to the Tainos who met them, to uh, kids on the, the Mayflower who outlived their parents, kids in the Alamo. I mean, it took six years to write the thing. And I think Pete liked it a lot because he has had a special empathy for young people, but also because he contributed a chapter uh, on Sybil Luddington, who was a, a girl who did the same sort of ride that Paul Revere did, only younger in the dead of night, farther and so forth. So he really liked it. So I sent him, when it was published, I, right before it was published, I sent him an advanced copy and said, would you, you know, consider writing a blurb of praise that we could use to publicize the book? He wrote back with a blurb, he had a blurb of praise, and he called me back and he said, this is wonderful, this is wonderful, how can I help you more? So I said, I don't know, this is great, thanks a lot. He said, is there anybody else uh, that would help you with a blurb of praise? That, and I said, sure, I'm sure they're all sort of, how about Studs Terkel, he said. I said, yeah, a blurb from Studs Terkel would help a lot. He said, send the book, send it to this address, by the time I, I call him, the, you know, the book will be here. Anyway, make a long story short, here came this, this, this huge paragraph saying, you know, this is the most important U.S. history book ever, you know. And this is, God, it was incredible, you know. So the phone rings again, you know, a couple weeks later. Did Studs write? You know, yeah, he did. Here's the, he said, that's great. He says, is there anybody else that can help you? <laughs> I'm sure there, you've done enough, Pete. Thanks a lot. He said, How about Bruce Springsteen? <laughs> so I, <laughs> I said, you know, a word from Bruce would surely help, you know. So he said the same thing, send it to John Landau, who was his manager, still is, I think, his manager. It didn't work, you know, it, Bruce didn't, didn't come through. But, I mean, that's really the kind of person he was. And the other book that, that we did that he liked, I wrote a, a book with my daughter, who was nine years old at the time. It is a, a dialogue between an aunt about to get squished and a child with a leg, leg lifted up about to squish it. It's called Hey Little Aunt. And it's basically a peace song. It, it was intended to isolate a moment in a person's life when they first realized they had the power not only to kill, but to refrain from killing. So I'm not going to sing it for you now. So when I'm standing, I'm the kid. With a, with a shoe raised up, when I'm seated, I'm the ant. Hey, little ant, down in the crack, can you hear me? Can you talk back? See my shoe. Can you see that? Well, now it's going to squish you flat. Please, oh please, do not squish me. Change your mind and let me be. I'm on my way home with a crumb of pie. Please don't hurt me. Don't make me die. Anyone knows an ant can't feel. You're so tiny, you don't look real. I'm so big and you're so small. I don't think it'll hurt at all. Yeah, well, you are a giant, and giants can't know how it feels to be an ant. Come down close. I think you'll see that you are very much like me. Are you crazy? Me like you? I've got a home and a family, too. You're just a speck that runs around. No one will care when my foot comes down. Oh, big friend, you are so wrong. My nestmates need me because I am strong. I dig our nest. Feed baby ants too. I must not die beneath your shoe. My mother says that ants are rude. They carry off our picnic food. They steal our chips and our bread crumbs too. It's good if I squish a crook like you. <laughs> I'm not a crook, kid. Read my lips. <laughs> <laughs> so 
sometimes ants need crumbs and chips. Why one single chip feeds our whole town? You must not let your foot come down. But all my friends squish ants each day. Squishing ants is just a game we play. My friends are looking at me. They're listening too. They all say I should squish you. Well, I can see you're big and strong. Decide for yourself what's right and wrong. If you were me and I were you, what would you want me to do? So when my daughter and I perform this together, we hold hands and sing in harmony. Should the ant get squished? Should the ant go free? It's up to the kid, not up to me. So we'll leave the kid with the raised up shoe. What do you think that kid should do? So the first time my, my daughter Hannah, who was nine, uh, and I ever sang that, it was at first night court when we had a big stage, and we'd been singing in a family band for a long time, so we sang the song and there was a lot of applause, and for the first time ever, hands were were up, stuck up. They were kids, you know, and so I said, yes? And this girl said, uh, what if it's a bee? <laughs> Somebody else said, what if it's a red ant? <laughs> Somebody else said, what if you spilled a glob of honey on your kitchen table and there are 500 ants? Don't you have to do something? You can see the adults in the... <laughs> going like that. But... Uh, Anyway, you know, as I, as I got to work with Pete over the years, we, we also found that we had a, another interest that was really that really bound us together besides books and, and children's music, and that was steel drum. I happened to mention to him that I had joined a steel drum band. It was the faculty band at Wayne Fleet, and Chris Bevan, its director, had let me, uh, uh, you know, come in to it as a ringer, and uh, I, I loved it, you know, and, and uh, so Pete uh, had had a lot to do with the popularization of steel band music in the United States in 1956. Steel band music is really the people's music more than maybe anything I know. In the 40s, uh, uh, during World War II, actually, these 55-gallon uh, oil drums, I mean, this is people's art out of, out of pure spoilage and, and weaponry, uh, they they cut them and they'd make marching bands. They th just cut the tops off and they'd be this big and they they'd go like that. Well, Pete happened to be down in Trinidad in '56 and he loved it. I mean, this was people's music, taking tools of oppression, and making art from them. He just ate that up. So he made a brilliant movie, how to you know about how to make and play steel drums. And you know he told me about that and I told him about our band and all this sort of stuff. And so we were together and he said, you know, I've got a, an old steel uh, drum that I made uh, that I'd like to give you. Would you come out and get it? Yeah, you know, I'd love to come out and get it. You know, so the day was arranged, and I came out there, and and uh, we stood and looked at this drum, and it was a piece of junk. I mean, nobody could play that 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 drum, and he knew it. You could just tell. You know, he's he's looking over it, and he, you know, nobody could do it. And he said, he's mumbling to himself, "Boy, I sure wish I could give you." The beautiful, you know, the chrome pan that, that Kim Loy from Trinidad had given to me, and I'm just standing there, not saying anything. And guilt, I guess, is mounting in him. I don't know what. And and so he says, "Wait here a minute, would you?" So I did. He goes inside, and his his wife Toshi uh, is in there, and and I hear him saying, "You know, could could we give Kim's drum to Phil?" You know, and Toshi says, "Can Phil hear this?" this conversation and Pete says nah he's, he's way back there. and so uh, she says well you know I, I, I guess it wouldn't hurt so he comes scampering back out you can have it you know you can have it so here is this beautiful beautiful chrome pan which you'll see it's, it's sitting it's just sitting right over there uh, that he uh, that he let me have and uh, it, it was just a, a wonderful thing in fact I ended up not playing for too many years longer, and giving it back, giving it to Wayne Fleet. But um, one thing that that was really cool about him, about Pete, is that he 
he popularized this. He wrote, it wasn't enough for Pete just to know about something or to see it himself. He was a teacher at heart. And so he had to teach, and he wrote this manual, How to Make and Play Steel Drums, 1956. He put it out there, probably five people read it. Okay, fast forward to like 1970, uh, Carl Chase of Blue Hill, the guy who, who was the leader of the clarion, Atlantic Clarion Steel Drum, is uh, a student, and he's on a, he wants to have a boat like the, the Clearwater that goes up and down the Hudson, an educational vessel. And, uh, but nothing's happening right for him. He's not getting many subscriptions. So they're out in the Caribbean, and Christmas comes, and the crewmates on his ship exchange Christmas presents. And what Carl got, this is in 1970, was this little manual, How to Make and Play Steel Drums by Pete Seeger. So he went, he raced home, sailed home, and he went to the local dump, got all these 55-gallon oil drums, made the entire band, and then recruited his neighbors, taught them all to play. He's a brilliant musician. And that's how steel drums started here in Maine and throughout New England. He's Johnny Appleseed because of Pete's manual. Well, Pete didn't know about this. He thought it was, you know, he'd never thought of it for, for a long time. And I wrote a piece for the Boston Globe Sunday Magazine about Carl being a, a pioneer and how much he owed to Pete Seeger and that, and that uh, little model. And Pete wrote me something saying, I'm weeping right now. I have no idea. It was just another example of how that guy spread his influence uh, through people's art and, and, and good work. Well, when I was at Pete's house, I saw how he really operated. Anyone who knew him got tons of postcards from him. And he got an incredible volume of mail. And he was somehow able to keep up with him. And it was his philosophy. He wanted to do that. He wanted to answer every piece of mail. But they tended to be postcards. And I always wondered why, when I got a postcard from him, my name would be written in one hand, and, somebody, and my address would be written in another. Well, I got to see it firsthand. Their office was in a barn, and Pete worked on a loft, and Toshi, his wife, worked underneath him. And uh, this was something she resented, complained about constantly. Who could blame her? But uh, Pete, every few hours, would take a batch of mail down the stairs and give him to, to Toshi. And that's why there were two, you know, signatures. And the, and the postcards that, that he would... Uh, I don't know if you'd be able to see this or not, but the postcards, he never missed an opportunity to teach. This is a postcard that he sent me, and he sent to a lot of people. It's the solar system, and it says, you are here. <laughs> Another one that I got, I must have had gotten this ten times, how to build global community, and there are just 50 suggestions <laughs> on it. But you know, uh, even... You know, time caught up even with, with Pete Seeger, which seemed amazing. And he couldn't keep up with the volume of correspondence, no matter how hard he tried. And so the last thing he wrote to the, the many, many people who uh, had corresponded with, him, corresponded with him over the decades was, was this. He said, uh, Until the last few years, my lefty reputation kept me out of the spotlight but now I've blown my cover. <laughs> Mail comes in by the bushel. The phone rings every minute. I have to say no to all sorts of good people who want me to listen to their CD, read their book, look at their DVD, come and accept an award, or who want to know when they can come and interview me. Now this form letter is sent to you. I apologize, but I urge you to stay well, keep involved, don't give up. The agricultural revolution took thousands of years. The industrial revolution took hundreds of years. The information revolution, he who did not have a computer, the information revolution is taking only decades. If we use the brains God gave us, who knows what miracles may now take place. Some of them have already. I'm mainly busy in my own hometown singing with kids. But I also sing in New York City and upriver occasionally. I take the opportunity to talk to people I disagree with. That's a skill we should all learn. Carry it on. Let's not use the word steal.